Ladies and gentlemen, dear students, it's a pleasure for me to welcome you at Technische Universität Berlin for this occasion. And I'll please ask you to give a special welcome to the CEO of Microsoft, who's for the first time in public appearance in Germany, as I understand, Satya Nadella. My name is Christian Thompson. I'm the president of the university, and um, I'd like to say a few words. I think that the university is the right place for an event like this for mainly a couple of reasons. For one, university with 32,000 students, as we have, is a place of the young generation, a generation who grew up with email, SMS, internet, WhatsApp, a generation that's really never, almost never offline, but always up to date and eager to get at our university the best education for the tasks will face them, which face them in life. And for second, Tier Berlin is a place of creativity and invention of IT systems. Science meets economy at this university. In our faculty, electrical engineering and computer science, every day um, people work interdisciplinary on innovations of technologies and thanks to the close collaboration with industrial partners that we have, it usually does not take very long until these inventions find their implementations. When talking about information technologies and how they change our world, there's one name that pops into my mind, and that is Konrad Zuse. Konrad Zuse is one of our most famous alumnus. He studied at Technische Universität in Berlin. His greatest achievement, as you know, was the world's first programmable computer, the functional program control Z3, which became operational in July 1941, more than 70 years ago. In that sense, Zuse gave an important impulse for today's information technology. And if he could, hear, could be here with us today, I'm sure he would be surprised how much the technology standards have changed our daily lives. Dear Mr. Nadell, we're very much looking forward to your presentation. May I please ask you to come on stage? Thank you very much. It's, an, uh, it's a big honor to have an accomplished engineer and leader of one of the largest companies in the world here uh, in uh, a technical university. Uh, we received a lot of questions, which I'm going to ask you in the following, but let me start with uh, an introduction of you, Satya. So Satya Nadella is the CEO of Microsoft. He held several leadership, senior leadership roles within uh, Microsoft in enterprise and consumer businesses. He was, among other uh, roles, he was executive vice president of Microsoft's cloud and enterprise group, something highly relevant uh, in the present uh, day internet, specifically in, in the context with the internet of things, and I think we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. He was head of research and development for uh, the online services division, and he was vice president of uh, Microsoft's business division. Uh, before joining Microsoft, uh, Satya was a member of another big, very well-known uh, computer company, Sun Microsystems. And on the private side, uh, Satya is originally from Hyderabad, India. He holds a bachelor degree in uh, electric, uh, electrical engineering from Mangalore University and a master's degree in computer science from University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. So he perfectly combines the two sides of uh, the faculty four here, electrotechnical engineering and computer science. Uh, he uh, is married and has three children. That's right. You got it all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got a very good breathing right now. <laughs> and the internet helped. <laughs> So, uh, let, me, let me start with probably the most interesting question people had. You are uh, the CEO of Microsoft, one of the most prominent uh, internet companies for nine months now. What have you learned through, uh, during that time? First of all, you know, let me just start by saying um, it's so exciting for me uh, to be in Berlin and to have a chance uh, to be in a university, and a technical university, and sort of speak to students, because there's nothing more energizing uh, in a given day than to be able to have a chance to talk to students who are bold and ambitious and unabashed in terms of what it is that, uh, that they're going after. And it gives me a lot of energy uh, and a great pleasure, and it's a real honor to be here. You know, the first nine months, I, 
I've spent 22 years. It feels like I've grown up uh, at Microsoft. Um, I did spend a couple of years at uh, Sun before joining, and it's the only job or the only company that I worked in. And so in some sense, I'm a consummate insider. Uh, but over the first nine months, I've had to make a pretty deliberate attempt uh, at making sure that I can look at the place I grew up in uh, from an outsider's perspective, because this is a business, this is an industry that is fast changing, um, and one has to be objective uh, about what changes uh, are affecting you and how you can ride these waves. Uh, and so I've had a chance to talk to many, in fact, I've had the chance to talk to many uh, incoming students. I spend a lot of time uh, in terms of the college recruits who join Microsoft to be able to be in touch uh, with their opinions about their preferences for programming languages to uh, devices uh, so that you really are in touch with the choices people are making. And it's just uh, been a very, very rewarding experience. And I think that that gives me a sort of a perspective on what we need to do going forward. So speaking of students, you were a student. <laughs> You are a trained engineer, you were a student like most people in this room, but uh, you also have a life outside technology. I uh, hear that you like to read poems, you read tons of, of non-technical books, which is very refreshing to hear. It's, I think it's always a problem if we stay within our confined uh, world without looking what's going on in the real world. So I would be interested in uh, if you could tell us a little bit about uh, uh, how important is it to have a training in language, in art, social science, the soft skills in the broadest sense? You know, I, one of the things that growing up in India, um, uh, what happens at least, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sort of particularly familiar with how uh, in Germany, how late uh, do you have to make a choice of your major, whereas in India, once you are out of high school, uh, and when I joined the electrical engineering, that was the last time I took any liberal arts class in my life. Um, and for whatever reason, but maybe because of my, both my uh, mother and my father were both uh, you know, uh, liberal arts folks. So my dad was an economist, my mom was a professor of Sanskrit. Um, and I've always been interested in books, uh, and, and, and it keeps me fresh. I mean, one of the things is you get into the work and you're in the middle of it, and the way to get perspective is to read something uh, very different. In fact, um, even th on this trip, I was you know, having a chance to read uh, an economist. Uh, his name is Brian Arthur, and he's written a very, very fascinating book on the evolution of technology. Turns out he, he actually debunks a little bit of what happens in technology. He talks about any new innovation as just modularization of old technology. And it's sort of uh, a great way to think about how technology evolves. Uh, and it gives you perspective. Um, it gives you a perspective on being able to think about and reason about what is your day job by doing things which are perhaps not directly related. Um, in the beginning, uh, I used to read a lot of literature, which is that is sort of uh, deeply interesting. I find that one of the common threads we have is that we are all human beings, and the best way to think about how human beings act is to read literature because it captures the essence. And since, as I've grown older, my attention span has come down, so uh, now all I can do is read poetry because it's good compression, right? It's uh, <laughs> uh, it's it's actually a much easier thing to keep my attention span. <laughs> Um, I, I have a follow-on question on that. I mean, I think it's really important. I try to do the same thing, but when I was a student and I was given that advice by my professors, I always thought, yeah, but how shall I fit this into my day? Because my day is f uh, filled with lectures, with uh, exercises, learning for exams. Now that I'm, I'm working after my uh, student life, I have way less time and I try to make space. When did it occur to you that this is so prominent and important for your professional development? You know, it's, I think one of the things um, that happens to all of us is somehow or the other, whenever you're doing something that you love, you find time. Uh, it's sort of strange, right, which is uh, whenever it is quote unquote work, you really never have time. Uh, but when I mean, it is not something that is work, you find all the time. So one, 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 one of the people I worked for many, many moons ago uh, said this to me, which is, uh, I think I was probably complaining about too much work or something. And he, this wise uh, boss of mine said, 
what if you did not think of it as work and you just thought of it as fun? Would it become any easier? Uh, I sort of wanted to say no. Uh, but later on, it struck me that a lot of things that you pursue are because of the passions we have. Uh, and more than any career development, do I think that somehow this is going to make a difference in the long run? I think that that's too much planning. Uh, I would say, especially uh, for anyone in this room, follow your passion, follow the thing that's exciting uh, to you, that gives you the fulfillment, and things work out. So you answered already part of my next question, which was like, uh, whenever you talk to industry, everybody says, of course, students, the, the new people on the job are the ones who bring the new innovation, who bring the passion. Now, I would like to know, because uh, most of the people here in the room are students, uh, how does your company support students? I mean, how uh, do you interest people in Microsoft? How do you feed the new generation to become passionate about the job? You know, for us, I would say college recruiting is just lifeblood for Microsoft. Um, something like close to 5% of the Microsoft workforce uh, enters each year uh, through college recruiting, and it's substantial numbers. Uh, in fact, I myself directly get involved in a lot of college recruiting. I'm calling college kids, convincing them to join Microsoft. It's a very competitive market, let me you know, first say that, because especially uh, for those who are graduating with computer science degrees today, uh, the, the market is hot. Uh, it's always been in the 22 years that I've been, it's always been hot. Uh, and it's very, very competitive. Um, and the key thing that at least I like to emphasize uh, anyone who's joining, it's like, it's the long-term impact you can have in, uh, in, with your work. One of the things I talk about, we spend so much time at work that if it does not have a deeper meaning than just, oh, work, then I think it's hard to sustain yourself. So one of the things that I will both like to see in somebody who is either applying or interviewing or wants to join Microsoft, what's their deep passion, not just for the work they're doing, but its impact on people. Uh, when I joined myself in, in 1992, it was the beginning of what became Windows NT. It was the beginning of a server operating system from Microsoft, and it was a bit of a, um, you know, no one really thought that we were serious about it. But I knew for sure that we were going to democratize uh, what was client-server computing in a massive way. Uh, and that was the impact I wanted to have. Uh, and that's what I believe, uh, you know, I had a great opportunity to, you know, see that journey in its fullness. And that's the thing that I look for when anyone is entering uh, Microsoft or any other company. And today, there is such, such opportunity for people here First of all, the online courses everywhere, uh, you know, provide you the access. Uh, this is just even, we have a thing called Virtual Academy. So there's not an, every single Microsoft technology is online and is available for anyone to learn. Uh, we have even this very, very cool program, which I love a lot, called the Imagine Cup. And many students participate in it. It's a programming contest uh, for all over the world. And, you know, students from all universities compete. Uh, we look and cultivate those things. In fact, many people who uh, have participated in the Imagine Cup competition end up joining Microsoft and have huge impact. Uh, so we're trying to really do a lot of things to be reaching people in universities and even in, call, and even in high school. Uh, one of the things that I'm very excited about uh, is our Minecraft acquisition. Uh, uh, it's... You know, it's going to introduce Microsoft to a very different generation and demographic, right? My, quite honestly, my eight-year-old daughter finally thought I was cool when she learned that uh, we bought Minecraft. Um, and, you know, it gave, got me some cred at home, finally. And, uh, and, and that's the kind of things that I think, you know, people start getting enthused about STEM education mm. and engineering in general and in computer science in general by introducing you to early programming. So you're still in the learning business. Yeah. <laughs> and it, if, if it helps with kids, I know how important that is. <laughs> now, um, you mentioned college recruitment. Now, this is quite different in the US than it, than it is in Europe. And it's quite alien world to a lot of people here, unless they have, they have been in the States 
or at least in an English-speaking country like the UK or, or Ireland. Now, could you probably tell us a little bit about that, how that works? I mean, before, it's quite useful before you go the first time into an assessment center if you want to work for a, a multinational company. And then, uh, now in retrospect, imagine you are a new st student wanting to join a major company, Microsoft, for example. How would you prepare for an interview? <laughs> Wow. <laughs> you bing it. <laughs> uh, That's also online. <laughs> yeah. That's helpful. <laughs> we can move on. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it's fascinating, right? I remember one of the things that I've said this um, um, story a couple of times before, but uh, I remember my own interview at Microsoft. Um, it was like a full day of back to back. Uh, interviews with uh, people giving you these programming puzzles. Those were days when we actually had pointer math. I think most students today don't learn pointers even. Uh, but in any case, um, I remember, you know, you know, they would give you the uh, marker and go to the whiteboard and, you know, here is a bubble sort with pointers that you got to solve in like two minutes. Um, and you go through it one after the other, and Microsoft is very well known for all these um, basically algorithmic puzzles. Um, they sort of sometimes feel like torture, but you kind of go through it all. I think and, a lot of students <laughs> still think it's torture. But here is the thing that happened. I mean, after seven hours or eight hours of it, I go to my final interviewer and the final question, and uh, this guy sort of looks at me and he says, look, here's the question. You're standing in a crossroads, you're about to cross the street, you hear a baby crying, having fallen right next to you. What are you going to do? And then I look at this guy and you say, what has happened to him? I mean, I thought he was going to ask me uh, maybe one more algorithm or something. And, uh, and I was 22 years old, um, and I thought about it for two minutes, and then I said, oh, I'm going to call 911, which is the emergency number. And then he gets up from his chair and he walks me out and he says, it's time for you to go. And I said, what? I mean, I must, you know, I must have blown the question. And then I ask him, what happened? He says, you know what? You might, in fact, have the smarts, but you lack empathy. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh my God, I was so devastated. I mean, uh, I went back. Uh, and I finally got the job, but, uh, uh, but it was one of those things which, quite frankly, perhaps I did not even understand it uh, for a long time, that IQ matters, um, and, but yet life's, I mean, the lessons of life, I think, only matter if you have the empathy and the EQ that go with it. Um, and perhaps more so than anything else, you will crack any interview that you hit. You're, you know, capable folks. You will, you're, you're after all in a top engineering school, and you are going to do well. The question is, especially if you make mistakes, like I have in many cases and many times, can you learn? Can you actually uh, empathize and then develop those skills? Because they matter, I think, to be successful in the long run. So I hear uh, it's important to endure. To Endurance. Pick yourself up. Pick yourself up and try again. Absolutely. I mean, you know, look. I mean, this notion that somehow perfection exists um, is only in the books, I guess. Um, uh, and to me, to be able to sort of think about the arc of your life. Here's a fascinating thing, right? One of the things that I was this weekend. Uh, again, with my daughter playing around with this Project Spark, which is actually a, a gaming tool. I don't know yeah. if you've ever yeah. seen it, which is very, very cool. It's an Xbox thing which teaches any kid to build games. Uh, and it's nice because it t tells you the hero's journey, right? the Joseph Campbell thing, where there is uh, a hero, there is an antagonist, and there is AI in games. Right. Uh, but it is the ability of the, you know, the hero's journey of being able to learn from your you know, own uh, lessons and mistakes. And to me, that I think is important. Uh, coming to a new topic. Uh, when you started as a CEO, uh, you sent a message to the entire company 
where you stated that uh, our industry, I quote you, does not respect tradition, it only respects innovation. What do you really mean uh, uh, about that? You know, the one thing about the tech industry, and quite honestly now I would say every industry in a competitive market only exists or you get to continue to play if you are reviving or renewing yourself. Um, and, and in our case, it's not about the past successes that you've had. Uh, it is really about new concepts uh, that you are really going after. Uh, to me, that is what truly speaks to whether you're going to be relevant in the future. And to me, at Microsoft, for us, uh, obviously, we are 39 years old now, and uh, we've been pretty successful. But the real question is, what is it that we are doing today to be relevant tomorrow? And you've got to remind yourself. In fact, you've got to ask yourself even the stark question, what will be missing if we went away? Uh, and use that as motivation for how you go about your innovation agenda. So that was the rallying cry for us. Um, and, you know, there's no such thing as tradition in a tech business. Uh, tradition, I mean, it's not to disrespect tradition. I think that there are certain things which are experiences and learnings that you should keep. Uh, but you've got to renew yourself, reinvent yourself, change and make change happen. Uh, that, I think, is at a premium. Um, I recently uh, read a very interesting quote uh, in a white paper by Bosch, one of the big German companies, that says the only enemy that you have is not uh, engaging early, mm. because that will make you go out of business. And the, the examples they cited were Kodak, who still manufactured uh, film, which is now a niche business, or uh, retail, uh, retail stores without uh, going into the online business. So do you think that uh, business in general can learn from uh, the more innovation-driven uh, online or computer science-based businesses? Uh, that's number one. And are there also lessons that uh, the internet business can learn from the more traditional businesses? No, that's a very really interesting one. But, you know, the, the general framework that at least I think about is for any business, any organization to be successful, three things, I believe, have to click into gear. Uh, one is you have to have new concepts or concepts that are novel, that are going to drive breakthroughs. In order to have these concepts ex you know, and execute on them, you need to have new capability. And in order to exercise that capability, you need to have culture. Uh, so the three things of concepts, capability, and culture, you've got to lock into gear and do a great job of it. Now, the fascinating thing about an established company is your existing success now means your concept, capability, and culture are a great match. But the problem is you now need to go after a new concept. And that is where really the hardship comes, which is how do you explicitly re uh, learn to relearn or unlearn, where you now need to have new concepts backed up with new capability and you need to change culture. Uh, that's perhaps the hardest part of any company. That's why people argue, hey, are startups easier to do? I mean, they are because you don't have any baggage. Uh, but the reality is, uh, in order for a successful company to be successful long term, which is very important for societies because the only way to have great sustained employment and growth in economies is to have successful large companies. Uh, so therefore, this renewal that happens by changing culture capability so that you have the ability to have new concepts is what is important. And to your question, I think there's a lot for us in the tech business to learn from traditional businesses. I mean, uh, when I look at the way some of the uh, companies, especially in a country like Germany, where some of the industrial houses have a long tradition of excellence, uh, that I think comes from institution building. Uh, and that's why culture matters. The values of round culture matter. 
but it also matters that how you keep it constantly renewed. To me, a learning organization is at the core of what I think the traditional businesses or the tech businesses have to do. Okay, that's the process. Now the million, or in your case, probably better, the billion dollar question, how does Microsoft innovate? You know, there, are, there is not one rhythm uh, to innovation. I'll give you an example of this. Take something like Skype Translate, which, by the way, is a project that I'm super excited about. Um, uh, this is, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a pro it's in fact just starting its uh, preview program, and it's, uh, it's very interesting to see the heritage of it. When I joined, sometime in 1994, I think, we hired our first set of people to do uh, fundamental research and engineering in speech recognition from Carnegie Mellon into Microsoft. I remember the day even because Bill sent out this mail about how we have hired this great guy from CMU uh, to help us with speech because our notions of speech was, oh, we're just going to do speech rec in uh, Windows. And it's been a pretty interesting uh, journey since then. And we've had development of speech recognition on one side, speech synthesis on the other side. In fact, speech recognition got much better once we introduced Kinect on the Xbox uh, because it's very important for training data and live data. And you know, the first place where we got that was on uh, Kinect. Um, and machine translation, which is another piece of technology, uh, grew out of what we were doing in Bain. And now we have Skype, which has real live data. And the fact that we were able to scaffold speech synthesis, speech recognition, and machine translation into one new deep neural net um, and marry it with Skype data. Now think about that, right? It's, it's serendipitous in some sense, right? It's not as when we started speech recognition work in 1994, we knew that you know, 20 years from there, we were going to spend $8 billion and buy Skype. Uh, but it's about large organizations having the ability to seize those moments where you can put things together to have breakthroughs like Skype Translate, which is going to solve one of the oldest human problems of simultaneous language translation. By the way, the one language we trained on is German, and most of my German-speaking friends tell me it's much better in English than German. Hopefully, we'll correct that. Uh, but that's the kind of innovation that I think that we are capable of doing. And it comes from some startup incubation type of rhythms, but then you've got to also have the moonshots, the high ambition to be able to do the heroic work uh, to make some break, uh, real breakthroughs. Okay, looking into the future a bit. I mean, I'm using one of the, of the biggest technology trends at the moment, so the Internet of Things. Uh, personally interested in that because we work a lot in that uh, area in my institute. There's a lot of, of talk about how hardware and software interconnect, cyber physical systems, the benefits, the threats. I think there's a very clear technical issue which still uh, needs to be tackled and that's the massive amount of data. Mm -hmm. Uh, how can we support that? I mean, I know we have clouds in the background, but still you need to transport the data. And then the next question is, how will this data be used and by whom? What will we do with all that data? I mean, uh, to, to be blunt, we could drown in information and start for knowledge. Oh, it's a very, it's an astute observation. In fact, um, today in Berlin, I've had the chance to meet perhaps more customers and partners on this entire you know, Internet of Things than at least on any single day I've done in a while. Because obviously, this being the heartfelt of some of the big industrial companies in Germany, uh, this is a very hot topic. I think you all refer to this as the uh, fourth wave of industrialization. And, uh, and it's fantastic to sort of uh, you know, learn a lot about it. But here is how I reason about uh, uh, the Internet of Things. First of all, it is about as much business model shift as its technology. Uh, because what is really happening is, instead of trying to make gross margin on the device, people are trying to make margin on the service. That's one of the foundational things that's really changing. Now you then you ask yourself, how does that change come about? Uh, one of the companies that we are working with uh, in Germany is ThyssenKrupp. Uh, which today makes elevators, and they have a long history uh, in Germany, obviously, of doing many different things. Uh, the 
elevator, uh, the elevators that they have are all connected today to a control service that's running in the cloud. And they have a very progressive way to the, the way they think about the servicing um, of the, the elevator. So for example, a hosp an elevator in a hospital is very different than an elevator in a stadium in terms of, let's say, preventive maintenance. Uh, because you really do not want to have uh, a, you know, a, preventive, a maintenance problem in an elevator in a hospital. So the, for example, they are able to write now contracts which differentiate between servicing between these um, uh, companies. And that ability comes from data because they are able to reason over all of the exhaust from all the elevators all the time. And you bring up a very important point. I think the platform providers like us, because our identity here is to provide technology so that you know, people like this and Krupp can actually build the solutions which transform their business. And to me, what has been important uh, there is how do you filter signal from noise, I think is even more important. Uh, so it's not about just having big data. It is about being able to have big insights. Uh, and I like the way you phrased it, because I think the, what is at a premium is both on the device itself, how do you get rid of all the noise before you rendezvous the data to the cloud? In the cloud, how do you run machine learning algorithms to be able to reduce the data to data that will really help you with the you know, preventive maintenance? And those are the kinds of things that I think uh, we need to be able to be perf you know, perfecting on an applied way, not a theoretical way, to make progress. Mm -hmm. I'm now changing to a more pessimistic worldview, <laughs> but uh, no worries. It's just, uh, you mentioned business models already. Now, as a technologist uh, or as a professor at university, I like to invent the future like you do in Microsoft. But is it still about these innovative companies or is it more about the business models? There is a lot of technology around that really hits it big, which is very poor technology and still there's a lot of money, even if it's, um, I'm inclined to say sometimes fake money, because there's a lot of promise, and uh, sometimes these companies create big bubbles and then do not deliver, whereas an established company uh, as Microsoft or also other big players, they have the technology, they have the technological skills, but it's much, much hard to make a business out of that. So is it still about technology? Is it more about the business model? Is it, was it always about the business model? I mean, I think it's um, always about the combination of the two, right? Because success comes from doing, you know, things which are technologically breakthroughs, but you've got to do it uh, at a price point and with a value proposition that's going to create markets, uh, especially in the technical, you know, technology business, you are creating new markets. It's not about just brand building per se. Uh, you build brands by building new markets. Um, and so therefore, there has to be a combination of business model. Uh, in fact, at least if you look back at our own success, I would say each one of the places where we've been able to achieve grand success is when we, both of them have magically come together. The technical innovation with the business model change. What comes first? I would say they have to come together. It's not about what comes first, because of course, you could say all, if you, all you have is a business model transformation and no technology, then you, know, you have nothing. Uh, but if you have the technology, but you don't have the business model, or a, I would say beyond a business model, a unique way to get to market, then you're not going to realize the potential. Uh, Does the Internet of Things have a business model? I'm trying to pick your brain a little bit because, of course, as a technology provider as well on the research I side, that's what I'm being asked. No, I absolutely do believe so. I think that the, you know, we just talked about it, which is if you believe that every sensor, everything in the world is a connected thing, then the question is, does that connected thing have more value than what the thing on its isolation had. That's the question that needs to be answered for a business model. And I absolutely believe so. So the question is, can you actually upgrade that thing in a much more you know, uh, iterative way? Can the lifetime maintenance of that thing be reduced? Does that benefit customers? Mm -hmm. So I think there are a variety of ways we can Let go at it. Let me challenge you. What is that? Let me challenge okay. you. Okay. <laughs> 
This is all off script, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> I apologize for that, but no, you're please. used to that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm my parents now. How do you make my life better with the Internet of Things? You are who? My parents. Oh, your parents. 65 year old. So how do you make my life better, Mr. Microsoft? I, you know, one of the things um, uh, I think about is I have a, a son who is 18 years old, uh, who is a, a severely handicapped uh, kid. And when I think about the kind of equipment, both prosthetics versus even the thing that we, in fact, the, the prosthetic bed we use for him, the technology shifts that have happened in the last five years and the quality of life he gets to enjoy because of it are magical. Uh, as a parent, I feel that those are the kind of physical things that are getting smarter can have profound impact. Uh, one of the projects we just recently did uh, in the UK, uh, which we talked about, I think, last week, uh, was for visually impaired um, uh, people. We did a project where we were able to create a 3D soundscape, which allowed them to have freedom of movement by just using sound. Um, and that's empowering. Uh, and one of the things I think about is, if you really look at people, you know, especially the, as populations are growing older, uh, what, assisted living is becoming more expensive, I think that technology and this Internet of Things can have a profound quality of life and uh, delivery of healthcare impact. I really like that vision. Because I think it, it also conveys an important message that, of course, there are technical problems to solve, but there has to be a practical need that we as technologists or as researchers can actually address. And I think a lot of good innovation comes out of that driver. So yep. thank you for that. Now, uh, coming back to the big elephant in the room, when you have uh, a senior person of Microsoft on the stage, of course, Windows is in the room. So my next question is, I, last week I read that you're going to put one Windows on any device. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit about your plans? I mean, because everything is in the clouds at the moment, so there's very little knowledge. Yeah. What do you plan? Yeah, so for, first of all, the next sort of generation of Windows, I mean, Windows 10 for me is not just another release of Windows, really. It's a, it's a fund, fundamental shift to a new generation. Why, uh, why of, 10? What is that? Why 10? Why not 9? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we just thought that 9 did not really capture the essence of a new generation, for whatever reason. <laughs> uh, so we said, let's skip one number. And uh, people accuse me of not knowing how to count, but it's OK. Uh, the, the thing for me in Windows 10, quite frankly, there's a lot of under-the-cover technology where we have layered Windows, uh, where we have a thing called the one core. So when we say we, we're running one Windows, it's not about trying to make one experience try be force fit on all form factors. We will have Windows from Internet of Things, four inches to 85 inches. It's going to be different experiences, but it's going to have this one core, uh, but consistency of the experience. We're also going to have one developer platform. Uh, one of the things that I'm very, very excited about is creating this opportunity for any developer, anyone here who wants to create a startup. I want to be, be, make it possible for you to target the 1.5 billion Windows users as a target market for you by writing once and being able to target all of these. And even from an IT perspective, we talked a lot about Internet of Things, yes. data, you know, security, management, Identity become very important. And so having that consistency control plane around Windows so that IT can manage these things that are running Windows is very important. So that's what we're trying to do with Windows 10. We're excited about it. We're also not just excited about the technology, but we're excited about even how we're going to market with it, which what I mean by that is even the development process is much more of a collaborative process. We have over 100,000 people already joined the Insider program, participating, giving us early feedback. Uh, and so it's exciting to sort of not only change what we're working on, but change the way we're working on it. I think that's a very good uh, uh, way to conclude that because as usual, if you talk about interesting things, 
time uh, moves very fast, so I fear we have to wrap up. You have a very busy schedule. Let me thank you again for taking the time uh, for this uh, appearance here at T uh, Technical University uh, of Berlin, and thank you for sharing in, uh, your insights with us. Thank you thank so you. much. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you so much.